so the last uh, session in this uh, track will be on authorization uh, which will be done by ben desrai uh, developer advocate at otho uh, his session is focused on the topic authorized is not a yes or no question hello everyone uh, hi ben how are you doing hey i'm good thanks yeah. Uh, hey, Jenks. I've just seen the uh, the comments through coming coming through in the comments. Hey, uh, can you uh, share your screen? Yes, I think I can. Let's see if this works. There we go. Yes, it's perfect. Yeah. So I leave the stage now to you. Uh, we'll join back after twenty minutes for the Q and A. Lovely. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's have a talk about authorization. We, whenever we're um, writing code, we um, and we want to lock certain bits of code away from certain people. We know that we can work out whether or not somebody is authenticated and do stuff whether or not they are. Uh, so we can lock things away behind an authentication uh, backend. This is most easily done already in a whole lot of front-end tools uh, or um, traditional web apps that we might see. Uh, an example is Laravel. There's a, if you're a PHP developer or you've seen any of the Laravel stuff, there's a, a similar thing to NPM um, for Laravel called Artisan and you can do Artisan make auth and you get login out of the box. Uh, it's really easy to add, but the hard thing then is, um, extending that beyond beyond just the, the standard login system. Uh, one thing you could do is go for some of the social logins to make it easier for your, your users to log in uh, based on accounts they already have. But at the end of the day, one of the issues we have with authentication is we only really have a binary, yes or no, are they logged in? So what I want to do is have a chat about what we can do with um, permissions, access control. We might know that somebody's logged in, but once they are logged in, how do we know what we want them to be able to do? So as uh, as mentioned, my name is Ben Decroy. I've been a software developer for 21 years now. This number keeps going up and that emoji is accurate. I am starting to feel quite old in this industry. Uh, for the largest part of that, I've been a privacy advocate. Um, I'm big in giving users control over the data that they share. Uh, I've been involved in the dev and open source community for almost all of that time. And those interests kind of culminated in me becoming the developer advocate for Auth0 in the APAC region. So that's my job today. I've been there for just over two years now. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I want to talk to you about security today. My um, social media handle is my name, Ben Decroy. If you want to get in touch with me uh, after the event, um, please feel free to reach out to me in most of the social media spaces with this uh, this handle. In Twitter, my DMs are open. Um, send me a message. I'd love to connect with you. So let's have a talk about access control. Access control comes in two major flavors. I'm not going to go into all the, the, the intricacies of the different kinds of access control, but by and large, when you're looking at access control, you have attribute uh, and role-based access control. Um, let's have a look at what those two are, what the pros and cons are. So attribute-based uh, access control focuses on four columns, uh, four specific sets of information that are used to determine whether or not somebody has access to a, an endpoint, a system, a process, whatever it is we're, we're controlling that access to. In terms of the subject, this is going to be information about the user, the person who's currently making a request to do some kind of action. The things we might know about them is a department they work in, or maybe in government we know their clearance level, or maybe in terms of a social media system um, network, we know what their age is. These are going to define the kinds of uh, actions that this user can take in certain contexts, depending on what APIs or whatever their, their browser is talking to, for example. We also want to base control dependent on the kind of action they want to take. So do they just want to read information? In most cases, unless it's top secret information, um, most, most people will be able to read that. Do they want to update and report on that though? That's probably going to require a high level of, of authentication. And uh, another thing that might happen is even like the, the read, update and report, they're kind of like the CRUD things, but there are more, um, different kinds of actions that could happen that aren't just purely on data, but things like, like approvals, that's almost like a process. Uh, approval could just be a flag in a database, but on the other hand, do we want to allow somebody access to a workflow in the system that allows them to go through a process of, um, for example, in the approvals situation, 
um, putting in feedback on uh, on why approval has been met, logging information if it's, for example, giving somebody access to a system, as well as approving a request for access, you'll probably want to put in a reason why access was granted. This is for auditing purposes in the future. So these kind of actions can be quite complex, but based on whether or not people are requesting that access um, will depend on whether or not the access control kicks in. So just to simplify that, you might find that you're able to uh, read and update information. You can't generate reports on it, and you definitely can't approve um, a, a request that comes through a system. The third column is objects. So this is the, the resource itself that we're trying to access. What kind of object is it? Is it a medical record? Is it high, uh, high risk if that gets leaked to the wrong person? Do we want to really keep tight control around that information? Or is it an image on a website? That's the, that's the type of object. And depending on what type it is, again, we can bring that into the attribute based access control uh, calculation of whether or not access should be granted. Clearance level we saw in subject. You, as well as knowing what clearance level a subject or the user has, we also need to know what clearance level is required for a certain object, if that's the case. And then we can have other things like geographic restrictions. Should the user be able to access it only from within an office environment? And then there's contextual stuff. This is outside of the, the realm of what they're trying to do and what they're trying to do it to. And this could be something like time-based uh, or location. Obviously, we'll need the location context if we're going to put geographical constraints on an object. But time-based as well. Maybe you're only allowed to access uh, company documents uh, during office hours. Or maybe if you're an accountant, you're only allowed to access the accounts records during the last two months of any quarter, because that's the only time you really need to be able to get that information in order to generate those reports. So we can group these together, and the attribute access control gives us really fine-grained control that says, if, for example, we want somebody to have access to approve something, then we have to have a, a minimum clearance level in order to have access to that information and also approve it. And they also need to be in a certain geographic region. In a government context, you might need to have a classification of at least, or a clearance level of at least top secret. You have to have the approve right, and you have to be within the government office at the time. So attribute access control gives us the power to do that. Role-based access control systems to put assignment directly to a user, but that makes management really hard. If you know that a user is a member of the HR team, for example, then there are certain things. So let's have a look at the actual example. Let's say Sarah is a senior partner at a law firm. And because she's a senior partner, we know she's allowed to uh, terminate associates. She's allowed to follow that process of letting an associate go. Uh, we could assign that directly to her, but then we've got to do that for every senior partner. And if she gets demoted, then we've got to make sure we remove that one permission away from her. Whereas if we make sure that the roles are always up to date and the roles have the permissions, it makes management a lot easier. So the comparison, if we look at them, uh, access-based is really powerful. It's complex. It's fine grain. You can do a lot. You can make sure that exactly every T is crossed and every I is dotted. It's great uh, for... Uh, information storage and access where you need a lot of auditing or you need, a, well, you can still do auditing in role-based access control, but you need that really fine-grained control um, because of the complexity of the systems you're operating in. Whereas role-based access control is a lot simpler. It's really fast. If you think about the processing required to calculate whether or not access should be granted, in role-based access control, you basically say, is the user a member of a role that has that permission? Yes or no. Whereas with uh, attribute-based access control, you've got to iterate through all of the different attributes and make sure that they all lie up the way they they were it's like a really complicated long if then else statement um with with multiple clauses whereas uh role based is a single uh, if then else statement rpac has a lot more coarse grained uh, which means you don't get that level of control but on the flip side obviously rpac is going to be um, a lot faster to implement in terms of uh, actually assigning roles uh, to two people uh, it's going to be a lot faster to for the for the application to interpret and also it's um sorry i just saw something come up in the chat and it just threw me for a second i'll probably cover it in, in, in later on so which one should you use the shortest answer to this is both or maybe it depends uh, there's no reason why you can't use access um, attribute based and role based access control in your systems but the thing that I would probably recommend is that you should start with role-based access control. If you can get away with just doing role-based access control, you're going to make it really um, fast to, to set up. 
I remember now what the other thing was uh, with uh, role-based access control. So um, in terms of the pros and cons, it's simple, fast, and coarse-grained, which means that um, it makes it a lot easier to add and remove people from the the groups um, to to manage. It's, if if a, an administrator comes in and needs to modify a user's access to systems, it's much easier to explain and document to them what that process is, whereas in ac uh, attribute-based access control, it requires the administrator who's managing these controls uh, and the, the attribute definitions uh, to have a deeper understanding of your overall systems. So for that reason, I would start with role-based access control. It's a simpler one for people to understand. It's harder to get wrong, and it's a, a lot faster uh, in, in terms of um, providing that, um, that definition of whether or not a user should have access within your system. If you find that role-based access control isn't quite giving you the level of control and granularity that you need, you can layer access uh, attribute-based access control over the top of it. You could have one that says uh, for role-based access control, yes, they have, have uh, permission to, but we also need to check the attributes. This could uh, really quickly filter out those types of people who are not allowed to do uh, a certain action and then do a second check, uh, which might take a bit longer, but doesn't have to be run unless we know the user even gets to that pre-check point. So that was a really quick overview of what uh, role-based access control and attribute-based access control is like. Given the time of this talk, um, I'm probably going to get through the demo towards the end uh, with the role-based access control. There's definitely not enough time to do an, uh, an attribute-based access control uh, demo today. But what I want to do is show you how if you used a, um, a, a product like Auth0 or a, um, an identity uh, in uh, as as a service type um, application in the cloud, there are ways of using the uh, the authentication me mechanism that's built into the identity providers, the JSON Web Token, uh, which we'll have a look at what a JSON Web Token looks like in case uh, you need a refresher on that or you're not familiar with them, and. Uh, adding into that JSON Web Token payload some claims about the permissions that a user has and how how we keep those secure. So because I don't want to go through, again, time-based um, constraints in this talk. I don't want to go through the process of setting up the entire application. I'm going to take you through the, the steps that I took in order to get to the point at which the demo starts at. So we're, we're starting with a fresh Gatsby application. Um, I like React. Gatsby is a really easy way to start up a new React app, even if you're not using the Gatsby um, build aspects of, of the, the platform. So we're going to go in there, and we're going to install the Auth0 React uh, SDK which specifically adds Auth0 capabilities to React. There's also a single page app SDK if you're using any of the other single page app front ends, and of course SDKs for web apps and, and all sorts of other stuff. But because it's a React based, we're using the React uh, SDK. And in order to activate the React SDK in any React app or a Gatsby app in this case, we need to wrap it, uh, wrap the application itself with your Auth0 provider. So if you're familiar with uh, React, you'll you'll probably know about providers and context. And basically what this is doing is making sure that every component in the React app now has access to this Auth0 provider, which means that we can now interact with the Auth0 SDK from any of our components. Within any of those components, we can use the with authentication required um, method down here and pass the component that we want to render back to that. This is a really simple way that the SDK provides for us to lock down a whole component. So a whole admin page, you have to be logged in. There are ways of doing uh, more fine-grained control uh, authentication checks within your application so you can show and hide bits of information on your page depending on the status of the, the user's session. Um, but uh, in terms of locking down a whole page, this is how you do that with the, the React uh, SDK. And then we're going to be connecting from our React app to an Express API. So within Express, we're going to install the Express JWT module and the JWKS RSA module. I won't go into what those do in depth right now. If you want to know more, ask me in the Q&A. If we run out, we can head over to the booth. Auth0 is sponsoring, so we've got a booth as well. Come have a chat with me afterwards. But essentially what we're doing is we're saying, look, we know that there's going to be a JSON Web Token passed in. We want Express to handle that JSON Web Token, validate it, and pull out the claims from that JSON Web Token so we know who's logged in. And then the second step we're going to do is using the Auths, uh, the Express JWT Auths module, which gives us the authorization as opposed to the authentication side of JWT checking. And what we're defining in here is basically a function that allows us to pass in a permission that we want to check for. And if that permission exists in the permission scope, and again, we'll have a look at the JWT to see what this looks like, but there'll be an array of permissions 
called permissions. If the permission we're looking for exists in there, then this will return true. And then finally, what we can do in our express router is we can pass the second parameter here. Uh, we can pass an array of checks that we want to do. So it helps if I don't actually click. There we go. <laughs> I won't click again. Um, so we're passing through a request to check that the JWT is valid, and then also check that the JWT has a permission called delete items in this case. All right, I think. Yeah, that's it. So this is what the website looks like. Um, but um, authorization doesn't work within an iframe. So I'm going to break out of my presentation and jump over to the actual website, which is running here on localhost port 8000. Um, I hope you can read this at home. If not, stick some in the comments and I'll try and make some of the text bigger. Um, but I've made it a little bigger already, so you should be able to see it. We have this shop where you can buy burgers, pizza, and tea, uh, and there's a login mechanism. So let's start off by logging in. And I've already configured Auth0 for this, uh, but I haven't configured the access control. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So I'll just log in with my uh, test account. So if we filter over here by Auth0, we'll see the request for the token. Um, so again, I can go into how the whole OAuth and OpenID Connect uh, flow works uh, afterwards if there's time. Um, but essentially what happens is once you've logged in, your application makes a request to Auth0 to say, hey, give me the tokens that I need. And it returns an access token and an ID token. And if we go to jwt.io, which is a tool that a colleague of mine wrote, which is a really good way of having a look at what the JSON web token contains, um, we can see, and a quick primer for JSON web tokens, we've got a header, a payload, and a signature. The signature in this case is a um, RSA SHA-256 based uh, signature. So it's a public private key uh, signing mechanism, which takes the header and the payload and signs that so that the API, in our case, the Express API, can verify that this data here hasn't been modified in transit because otherwise the signature is going to fail. So this means we can now trust, if we trust the signature, we can now trust the payload. And we can see in here already that there's a permissions um, uh, array. Uh, that would not normally be enabled. So let me just uh, correct something from testing. So I'd already enabled RBAC when I was testing this uh, talk beforehand. So what would normally happen is if I log out and log back in again, when you log in uh, with Auth0 and you don't have um, role-based access control enabled already, you would get this token here, which doesn't contain that permissions. So we know that the issuer was my Auth0 tenant. We know the subject, which is my unique ID for my user. Um, we know that the, uh, sorry, th this one here, port 7000. So the API that I'm running on port 7000 locally uh, is an intended audience for this token. So we can use this access token to make requests to the API now. So I come into the admin page here. We can see uh, that there's a facility for editing. And if I hit save changes here, we're going to get a, you don't have permission to do this. And if we filter this by 7,000, we'll see the 403 here for the put. Um, similarly, we'll also see a 403 after a delete. And if we try and add a new one, we'll see a 403 there for, for the post. So we don't have permissions yet. Uh, let's fix that. So as shown in the presentation, um, in the Express app itself, we are pulling in the check WJ, J, JWT in the check permissions methods that were described in the presentation. They've been pulled out into these middleware uh, files here. And we're also pulling in a list of item permissions. So the permissions that we want to be able to verify, uh, if we look down here, so getting is all open. We don't need any permissions here. But if we post, uh, we want to check that there's a permission that the JWT is valid. And do they have the permission to create items? And then for put, we've got update items. And for delete, we've got delete items. So if we look at what these are actually defined as, these are basically these strings here. So we need to define some uh, permissions with these strings. So let's jump back into uh, Auth0. So on the basis that you have Auth0 integrated already and you've got your API working, I can talk you through that in another, uh, like afterwards at, at the booth if you want to, to find out more about how to do that. Um, but once you've got that, by default, our back is disabled. So I'm going to enable role-based access control. And I'm also going to opt to add that permissions array back into the JSON web token. By default, it won't be added in. This will add that in for us. So you can have role-based access control without overloading that payload. In our case, we want that to come through because we're going to use it. 
we're going to create some permissions here. So I've just come across to the permissions tab. We're going to create one called create items. I'm just going to use the same description because it's easier to copy and paste. Um, but you can give that description whatever you want. Uh, we also want another permission called update items. And we want another permission called delete items. But this API now knows that there are various scopes that can be applied. And these scopes are um, permissions that a user or a bearer of an access token um, may or may not have and will get passed through uh, as part of that JSON web token to determine whether or not the um, the endpoint that's being called should uh, should be allowed to be called or, or to, to complete. So under users and roles, I'm just going to create two roles now. I'm going to create one role called admin. And this admin user, I'm going to assign some permissions to. Um, now, because you can have multiple APIs configured in North Zero, it asks you which API you're con connecting to or you're talking about. I've only got one. And in here, I want to say admin can do all three of these. We go back to the roles and we create another one called editor. I'm going to permissions here, and I'm going to add the permissions for uh, create and update. So an editor can't delete, but they can create and update existing records. So now the only thing I need to do is assign that role uh, to a user. I've got my one user in here. I'm going to assign to start with, I'm going to assign the editor role to my account. Now, because the application's already got an access token, I'm going to have to log out and log back in again so that a new access token is generated. So if I do that, now see, let's have a look at the token that just got returned. And this one now has the permissions array again. But the permissions array contains just the create items and update items. So the Express API, when it receives this payload, is going to now know that these permissions are, are assigned. And also by verifying the signature, which happens as part of the Express JWT library, uh, it, it's also and the JWK SRSA libraries as well, it's able to verify that the payload hasn't been modified. So it can trust the fact that these permissions or these, these claims are accurate. So now if I come back into the admin area, I should be able to edit burgers. Let's make that singular. We'll save those changes. Uh, if we just come back in over here, we can see we've now got a 200 response on uh, 200 response on boot. Hey, Prahavanth. Uh, hey, Ben. <laughs> hey. Last couple of minutes. Uh... Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, we can add items. So that's arrived in there. But we can't delete items still because we're not an admin. If I change my role to admin, obviously, that role will now pass. Uh, and we'll be able to delete the item. So I hope from this that uh, that what I've managed to help you understand is not just what role-based access control and attribute-based access control are, but how easy it is, especially within Auth0, to uh, implement role-based access control just by clicking a few, uh, enabling a few toggles on your API configuration, defining those permissions and roles and assigning them to the users. Uh, your, uh, your APIs are now going to be able to consume those JWTs. Uh, the JSON web tokens and understand what permissions that user or the bearer of that token uh, has been granted. Um, I don't know whether that was a couple of minutes until the end. I think we still have five minutes for Q&A, so I'm happy to take some questions if there is time. Um, but like I said, there is. Uh, uh, we are over at the booth as well, so feel free to hit me up over there. And finally, I just want to finish with this slide to thank you all for coming along and listening to my very rapid uh, demo. Um, I hope that it's made sense. If you want to have a look at this code yourself, the shop site is up at this GitHub URL. If you head to a0.2 slash API days dash t-shirt, um, you can uh, go in for, well, it's not even going for the running. You will get a t-shirt. You've got to fill in a little form and we'll send you an all zero t-shirt. And like I mentioned, I'm Ben Decry. Uh, hit me up on Twitter DMs or any other social media you can find me. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, we have already one question for you. Um, what is the best place to store this token so that it is secured? That's a really good question. And I don't know how much time I have, but it, it, the, the basic answer is depends. So by and large, it, it's recommended that you store any access tokens in memory. Because so when it comes to JWTs, you've got the ID token, which is about the user. You've got the access token, which is what the bearer can do. You send that to APIs. And then you've got a refresh token, which can be used to request a new token if the old access token is expired. So each of these have different use cases, and each of them have different risk models. 
With an access token, generally, I would prefer to keep it in memory, which means that if you refresh your web application, if it's a single page app, for example, um, then you're going to have to get that token again somehow. And there are ways of doing that. I won't go into that because of time. If you're running, if you're writing a, a traditional web application where you've got a server at the back end, then your authentication flow is different. You can actually store those in on the server in a session, and then you can have a cookie with the user, and those that data then never gets leaked to the front end. But one of the, the, the issues you need to work out is um, if you've got a single page app, where to store those. You can store them in local storage. There are pros and cons of doing that. Again, I can go into that in, in a longer discussion at the booth afterwards if you like. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you want to know more, come and talk to me because like, I, I, I can't give the answer justice in such a short time period. Okay, yep, got it. Uh, the next one is, what is the most secure algorithm for JWT token? Uh, I'm not going to answer what the most secure is, mostly because um, this might change any time and I don't want to make a statement that sounds authoritative. However, what I would say is, by and large, mostly we have the choice between uh, HS or HMAC 256 um, hashing and RSA to fit, uh, SHA 256. RSA is the public private key. HS256 is the pre-shared key where every system has to know what that pre-shared key is. The downside to that is if the pre-shared key gets leaked, then any man in the middle attack can change the token uh, and create a valid signature. Whereas obviously a public private key uh, hashing mechanism, signing mechanism is going to be a lot more uh, secure in that way. Again, there are downsides to using RSA256 uh, over uh, HS256 in that you need to um, provide the public key somehow. And there are ways of doing that as long as the application you're trying to log into has public internet access. Um, there are other ways of doing it as well, of embedding it in your application. If you if you can, I would recommend any kind of public private key hashing algorithm that's in the, the specs. And also if you head over to uh, jwt.io again. There's actually a whole lot of information here on uh, the libraries that are available and the hashing algorithms that um, that are valid. So have a look through here um, and, and pick one that works for you. But if you can do public private key and that works for your model, uh, that would be my preference over a pre-shared key. I hope that makes sense. Yep, yep. Thanks, Ben. Um, That's all right. So thank you. Um, so no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. All right, I'm going to hang over to the booth. Thank you all for joining yeah. me and enjoy yeah. the rest of the conference.